This is a film on the construction of the National Library of Australia. The National Library of Australia, the first of the large and more important of the monumental buildings to be constructed in the national capital, Canberra. Stage one of the library building stands on the foreshores of Lake Burley Griffin at the northwestern corner of the Parliamentary Triangle, the focal point of the capital. Until the completion of the new building in 1968, the National Library was accommodated in many parts of Canberra. Widely separated temporary structures housed Australia's heritage of literature, film, documents, and much of the National Library's unique pictorial collection of the early beginnings of the Australian way of life as we know it today. By 1964, the National Library's book collection comprised 760,000 volumes and was growing at the rate of 65,000 volumes a year. And so the federal government decided there should be a building to house the National Library of Australia under one roof for the first time. Architects Bunning and Madden, in association with T.E. Armani of Sydney, designed the building in consultation with the National Capital Development Commission, the authority responsible on behalf of the Commonwealth Government for the planning and development of Canberra. In May 1964, the work went from the drawing board onto the ground. And a start was made on the foundations of the new building to provide a functional library based on the most up-to-date ideas of library planning and also to grace the parliamentary triangle with a handsome and monumental structure whose functions over many years would serve scholars, government departments and the public. progress very rapidly. And then in March 1966, when the building was well advanced, the foundation stone was set by the former Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies. The Prime Minister of the day, Mr. Harold Holt, in introducing Sir Robert, said, The National Library is assembling the records of the past, as well as those which will reflect current activities. For we cannot understand the present or plan for the future without a knowledge of the past. The resources of the library will be available as they should be uh, to Australian people everywhere. I turn to my task of calling on uh, Sir Robert. <laughs> but this uh, library, of course, like all great national libraries, has another function. I it's to interpret the present through the present. It's so that people now writing, now publishing, can communicate with people who are interested in the kind of thing that they're writing about. This is the great means of education by communication, to interpret the present to the present. And that's not merely a national exercise, because if this library does what I confidently believe it will, then it will be a source of light for scholars, for thinkers, in all other countries of the world, it will have a great international significance. <laughs> to the great advantage of this nation, I declare this stone to have been well, and so far as I can judge, truly laid. <laughs> and so construction continued and scaffolding keeps pace with the rising structure as floor succeeds floor. stage of the National Library, when completed, will be a horizontal building of five storeys and two basement floors 
340 feet long by 149 feet wide. The structure having in all more than eight acres of floor space. Apart from the imposing entrance foyer, this central block will accommodate all working departments of the library, including book stacks holding more than a million volumes, specialized reading rooms, a general reference reading room of noble proportions, a boardroom, a theater, theaterettes, a microfilm reading room, and catalog bibliography room. The marble and travertine facing is fixed on metal cramps and stands clear of the face of the structure, leaving an airspace between. This modern technique enables the facing under conditions of sunshine or shadow to expand or contract without danger of cracking. The classic form of the building and the aesthetic expression clearly denote the building's important function even in the material used on the outside. Granite, slate, bronze, copper and various marbles including Roman travertine. An overhanging cornice projecting 20 feet from the main wall is supported by 44 pedestal columns, 4 feet wide and 70 feet high, which are covered with white Carrara marble slabs. The use of deep overhangs, large areas of unbroken walling and columns, was conceived by the designers for the clear atmosphere of Canberra, which calls for heavy shadow to give shelter from sun and glare. level is reached. Insulating sheets are placed on the steel girders and will lie protectively beneath the copper sheathing of the roof. Window frames are of bronze. The seams of the windows are rubber corked and covered with plastic tape. The bronze spandrel panels between the windows are caught with a mastic compound. The base or podium is clad in grey bar or trachyte, stone of a rugged character in keeping with its vault like function. The main book stacks are air conditioned and in fact are housed behind this facade which is coped with sawn trachyte later to be topped with a granite handrail. Preparations are made for the podium paving around the main structure. Norwegian quartzite tiles are laid.
noted Australian artist Leonard French of Melbourne was commissioned to design and produce 16 coloured glass windows. These were for the exhibition areas on either side of the main entrance foyer. The windows measure 11 feet 4 inches high by 4 feet 3 inches and are of themes based on the planets, ranging through all colours of the spectrum. Six internal columns clad in white Carrara marble are in the spacious entrance foyer and run through two floors to support a mezzanine gallery, which is approached by stairs of Greek white pentelic marble, the stairwell being of blue-green Italian slate. The large general reference room, with its walls and ceilings clad in acoustically absorbent panels, nears completion. Now that the paving of the terrace is finished, the lower sections of the columns can be clad in marble without risk of damage. The steps of the library are completed in South Australian sawn granite, while the forecourt is prepared for paving with exposed aggregate. One of the final works undertaken at the library is the installation, testing and adjusting of decorative twin fountains set in a large pool in front of the main facade. The fountains will have rising central jets 27 feet high, surrounded by coronets of fine sprays, and at night will be floodlit from beneath. Terrace balustrade of imperial black polished South Australian granite is about the last work to be executed in the actual construction of the National Library. There remains only the many small clearing and finishing jobs to complete the project. Some 5,000 yards of carpet were laid, adding further to the quiet atmosphere of a place for reading and for study. With the basic construction of the National Library now being finished, the National Capital Development Commissioner, Sir John Overall, formally hands over the building to the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, Mr Richard Kingsland, who in turn hands the symbolic golden key over to the Chairman of the Library Council, Sir Grenfell Price. The only outside ornament on the National Library is to be above the main entrance doors. a beaten copper bar relief, designed and executed by the Australian sculptor Tom Bass at his Minto property. It had to be transported in three sections by road 144 miles to Canberra. It is 70 feet long and 7 feet high. Its free-flowing lines are contrast to the severely disciplined columns. The words, arc, 
sun and tree in cuneiform are the basis of the design. now needs to be done is the furnishing and stocking. The whole large building is of course air conditioned. The entrance foyer floor of Australian golden Wombian marble is completed as are the foyer staircase and stairwell, while the foyer walls of Italian travertine marble are filled and polished. French artist Mathieu Matigo was commissioned by the Library Council to design three tapestries for the foyer, symbolically depicting Australian themes. The vivid stained glass windows add dramatically to the quality of the exhibition areas of the foyer. The general reference room on the ground floor is 168 feet long and 38 feet wide. It would accommodate 160 readers. The Roman travertine marble strikingly enhances the colonnades. The entrance podium area and steps are ready, and the fountains give a lively and pleasant introduction to the impressive facade of the massive structure. Through the building's high colonnade, some of Canberra's skyline can be seen across the waters of Lake Burley Griffin. A reminder that the functions of the library are there to be used by the public, while the building itself adds to the quality of the national capital. All is ready. Now comes the culminating moment, the official opening of the National Library of Australia on the 15th of August, 1968, by the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable John Gordon. Just over a hundred years ago, another man, opening another library, said, and I quote, a great library contains the diaries of the human race. A library as part of a worldwide library service will keep that diary up to date for us to study the world's todays, as well as its yesterdays, and by being able to study its todays and its yesterdays, perhaps enable us to be the more wise in seeking to shape the world's tomorrows. I have such pleasure in declaring this National Library open. And so, after a period of four years' construction, the library now enters its life of service to Australian scholarship and research, standing forth clearly in the Canberra scene as a contemporary version in the spirit of classical design.